artificial moon, satellites past, present, and future. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week, we look at satellites, the artificial moons orbiting the Earth as well as other worlds. We're going to explore the history of satellites, look into how we all depend on these devices, and glimpse the future of these technological marvels as we explore beyond our own planet. Later on, we're going to talk with Mark Bell, CEO of Terran Orbital, about small sat technology and the future of satellites. In 1957, half of the top 10 most popular television series were westerns, telling largely one-sided tales of the westward expansion of European settlers into native lands. Movies of the year included Invasion of the Saucer Men and The Robot vs. the Aztec Mummy. It's a classic, you gotta see it. At the time, the idea of an artificial moon orbiting Earth was pure science fiction. The Cold War raged as the United States and the Soviet Union raced to place the first artificial moon in orbit around the Earth. On the 4th of October, 1957, Sputnik roared into space and into the American psyche. This success came earlier than U.S. officials expected, and Sputnik was significantly more massive than thought possible. The launch signal to Soviet Union was a match to the United States in both technology as well as military prowess. Driven by orders from President Eisenhower, the United States placed Explorer 1 into orbit on the 31st of January of the following year. Flying higher than Sputnik for a significantly longer time than its predecessor, this mission became the first major triumph of the U.S. space program. Taking place a few months before the founding of NASA, Explorer 1 was also the first observatory in space studying the Earth as well as the sun. A little over three months later, the first uh, communication satellite, Telstar 1, roared into orbit. On the 1st of April 1960, Tyros 1 became the first weather observation satellite, developed in part by the fledgling federal agencies NASA and NOAA. The, now, the atmosphere of Earth typically blocks or most of the X-ray radiation from space from reaching the surface of our planet. Whew. However, many powerful events happening among the stars radiate brightest in these wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. To see these events, astronomers launched the first X-ray telescope, Uhuru into orbit above the Earth during the closing weeks of 1970. Now, today, the exact number of satellites orbiting Earth is uncertain, but roughly 6,500 were recorded in 2021 by the Union of Concerned Scientists. Just over half of these are currently active. More than half of the active satellites in operation today are dedicated to communication. About one in four set their sights to the observation of Earth. Smaller numbers contribute to technology demonstrations and tests, as well as astronomy and Earth science. Now, the other half of the satellites orbiting Earth, the defunct ones, you remember them, right? Can pose significant hazards to both crewed as well as robotic missions as well as playing havoc with astronomers' views of distant targets. And for every satellite, alive or dead, there are thousands of additional pieces of smaller bits of space junk soaring around the Earth. These include flecks of paint, small pieces of hardware, 
and the occasional bag of frozen urine whipping around it 29,000 kilometers per hour or about 18,000 miles per hour, nearly six times faster than the world's fastest fighter jet, we think. Uh, you do not want to be hit by one of those. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Today, our modern civilization relies on satellites to power our phones, coordinate transportation, and provide our, one of our, some of our best looks at the cosmos around us, including the world on which nearly all of us live. Recent developments include small sats, satellites smaller than a typical refrigerator, sometimes much smaller. One class of small sats are CubeSats, uh, cubical nano satellites, just 10 centimeters or about four inches on a side. These systems can be held in one hand it can be easily joined together into larger units. We talked with Mark Bell, CEO of Terran Orbital, about, this, about his mission to develop this next generation of satellites. This week on the Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Mark Bell. He is CEO of Terran Orbital. He designs and manufactures mini satellites, which could just revolutionize things in the years to come. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, so can you give us just a real First glimpse, what is Terran Orbital and what is it that you hope to accomplish? So Terran Orbital is one of the largest manufacturers of small sats here in the United States. Uh, we are a one-stop shop. We design, build, manufacture, do launch integration and mission support after it's in orbit. Uh, we have two sides to the business. One is our manufacturing side, which we call Satellite Solutions, and the other side is Mission Solutions, where we build satellites that we own. That's, that's very cool. So for those who may not know about mini satellites, you know, what are the advantage of them? What can they do? What is a mini satellite, Mark? You know, I, the reality is everything's changing. With your iPhone today having as much computing power as the space shuttle did years ago, you know, you're able to do things in a much smaller, cost-effective form factor. And so it's now making it cost-effective to do lots of things from low Earth orbit that you just couldn't do before. Hmm. And how, how, does, how does that compare to, like, the CubeSats that some people may know with, you know, four and a half, five so inches on a side? So we were the inventors of the CubeSat. So Ty, one of our companies, Tyvac, was founded by Do Dr. Jordi Pug Suari, and he was the co-inventor of the CubeSat with Bob Twiggs. So we are the pioneers in this industry. And we've gone from the CubeSat, the small cube, to now much larger satellites at almost the same price point. That's amazing. And, uh, you know, they seem to have another thing now where, you know, I don't know if you've seen the Astro Bees, aboard aboard the International Space Station, these little, you know, almost CubeSat-looking uh, uh, AI-powered assistants that the astronauts are using. It's just this pretty amazing. There's so much you're able to do in this small form factor. And with us, you know, we started with the cubes, then it went to three, what's called a three U, which is three cubes together. Then it was six U cubes together. But now we're building things the size of uh, small refrigerators. Uh, our average satellite now is about 350 kilograms, where it was just a couple of kilograms when we first started. 
And so, you know, on one hand, they've gotten bigger, but the power and the technology has gotten so advanced, we can now replace what was done before in geosynchronous orbit. That's, that's incredible. And you mentioned phones and how everything has, you know, become smaller and it's a natural progression through electronics, you know, better, smaller, cheaper. And um, so how are how is your technology and your research feeding off of advances in consumer and popular electronics and feeding back into that? You know, the great thing about building satellites, you know, like what we do now, is that we're able to build, design, build, and launch a satellite while the current version of the iPhone still exists. Where it used to take five to ten years, as you know, to design, build, and launch a satellite and it cost sometimes billions of dollars. Now it's millions of dollars, and we can do it very quickly. So the technology is always current. And the great part about Leo is, you know, on one hand, they only last five years because they're not radiation hardened. So eventually they'll burn out, would burn up, burn out, and then burn up in the atmosphere. But we're constantly replenishing constellations with the most modern technology. So you never go obsolete. It's guaranteed non-obsolescence. And so how about you? What, what got you into this field? You know, as a kid, I always wanted to be an astronaut. I was always, I became a Star Trek, -y, a Star Trek fan when I was 10 years old. Is and uh, <laughs> always, uh, <laughs> and I just, you know, the whole idea of getting in this industry I always found exciting. And about 25 years ago, I had the opportunity. I had a company called Globix. We had run, we were building a, one of the original internet parts of the original internet backbone. We had ran 28,000 miles around the world of fiber, but we couldn't reach everywhere. So we decided to reach Eastern Europe with uh, satellites. We started building ground stations throughout Eastern Europe, and we built a company called NetSat Express. And that was my first entry into the satellite industry. And I've been addicted ever since. That's, that's fabulous. And so you folks are building the world's most Advanced Earth Observation Constellation. Tell us about that. That's correct. We're building a constellation which we call Predisar. So think of Predator and Synthetic Aperture Radar. But it's more than that. If you think of Earth Observation 1.0, it's electric optical imaging. People where you know, you see you you see you see in Google Earth that your house on a clear sunny day, uh, but it has to be sun has to be out, can't be cloudy, not at night. Now you add software-defined synthetic aperture radar. We could see through clouds. We could see at night. Now mix the now it's Earth Observation 2.0 is what we refer to it, and Earth Observation 3.0 is where you take optical imaging and synthetic aperture radar and merge them together. And that's what we're doing. So think of it as 24-hour persistent coverage of anywhere on the Earth, uh, on no matter what what the weather is or time of day. That's cool. So how, what is synthetic aperture radar? How is it, what's the basics of it? Synthetic aperture radar are basically bouncing a, a radar image off the Earth, a beam off the Earth, and we're using that, then a computer then, to take that data and create a digital, an, a digital image of what it saw. So we can see, and whereas a camera, you can't tell depth, we can tell depth of an object. We can tell what the object's made of because we know the chemical composition. It, uh, because it, well, just like a, the old school TVs with the rabbit ears, you get to see, you could see through object, objects if you know the if you know the waveform of that chem, of that object. Fabulous. And so you know, you, you building a constellate building constellations is now being done not only by you but by several other organizations and so now we're entering an era when we have tens of thousands perhaps soon hundreds of thousands more than a hundred thousand objects in space how, how do we manage how do we manage all that traffic so you know we, we call that space situational awareness to manage the traffic but if you think about it you have you know 60 percent of the earth is covered by water 40 percent by land you have 3.2 billion cars that drive around every day on that land. And, it, you, and you have very little Y on Earth, being the height. You know, Burj Khalifa being the tallest building, about 2,000 feet of Y. In space, you have 43,000 miles of Y 
you have a lot of space in space, and but you need traffic management. You know, you have a lot of objects today. You have a lot of debris that's now happening today, and so uh, the government's doing a very good job of building programs to track these objects. And satellites are becoming smart enough that they can move out of the way of debris on their own. Similar to how your car, you try to steer your car out of the way to avoid an accident, but it does it all automatically. How do you see many satellites operating? Uh, as we and assisting people as we move out into beyond the cradle of the earth. You know, you could, now you're able to do 5G from sa- space. So imagine cellular all over the planet, Internet of Things, Internet all over the planet. You know, it is uh, knowing more about our planet, global warming, you know, be able to control global warming better, to help find everything from indigenous tribes in the rainforests of Brazil to watching the ice melts. Uh, in the ocean. And there's lots of things we can do to make the planet a better place, a more sustainable place using Earth observation. That's fabulous. And so what, finally, what's, what is next for Terran Orbital? You know, we're, we're in the middle now of going public through a SPAC. We're merging into a company called Tailwind 2 Acquisition, which is a TWNT on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, it will become Terran Orbital hopefully later this quarter. So we're very excited about that. And um, we're going to be building the world's largest satellite assembly facility in Florida. Uh, it'll be able to produce over 1,000 satellites a year. It'll be over 600,000 square foot facility. And uh, we're very excited about that. A lot of exciting things going on around here. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Mark. It was great talking with you. Thank you very much for having me. I, I look forward to being here again soon. Great. And that was Mark Bell, CEO of Terran Orbital. In addition to whipping around the Earth, satellites also found around the Moon, Mars, and other worlds. As the human race reaches out to other worlds, satellites will become increasingly essential to our day-to-day living. Like people on Earth today, settlers on the Moon or Mars will depend on satellites to operate communications, observations, and transportation systems. In the early years of interplanetary habitation, outposts will also rely upon regular supply missions from Earth to maintain their most basic needs. These robotic deliveries are likely to be directed and guided by satellites in and beyond the orbit of Earth. Now, space is hard, and a cruise of explorers setting out into the final frontier will depend on the proper functioning of satellites for everyday survival. Spacecraft bringing crews between human outposts in space will need to have robust communication systems. These are going to depend on satellites around the Earth, Moon, Mars, and beyond. Satellites, once regarded as artificial moons, are an essential tool to realizing the next stage in the human saga living permanently beyond the Earth. Now you can watch every episode of the show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. What, you have something better to do? Come on! It's true. Please subscribe, follow, and share this show with your friends. And for any of you out there celebrating it this week, happy St. Patrick's Day. So join us next week, uh, starting on the 22nd, when we talk about the future of music in space with Doug Halvering, host of The Daily Doug. Here's wishing you all out there clear skies.